group of outsiders could go and look at it and then work with the government and work with the UK government register to improve the quality of this data. This is just one small example of where transparency of government information allowed a third party to improve data quality in the way that I don't think government itself could. Now, the idea that transparency will improve the lives of citizens is based on a few fundamental premises. The first is that officials and politicians care about evidence. The second is that government is responsive to outside pressure. And the final one, I think, is that there are forces outside of government, whether NGOs, journalists, members of the public, or businesses, who can use information about government activity to successfully change a government's approach. That's the theory. Uh, now, I think that this theory is under strain for two fundamental reasons. And this approach and this hypothesis, which certainly I've been working towards for the last uh, chunk of my career and continue to do. Now, the first challenge is that the transparency, openness, accountability, open data sector is maturing. Uh, the initial promise is that openness, and in particular open data, would lead to a radical change in outcomes for citizens. Hasn't, hasn't quite happened, um, despite some really good individual examples. Now, I think there is a real danger that the transparency agenda, uh, once fashionable in international politics, uh, becomes yesterday's fad. Uh, and indeed, last year, Huffington Post published a, a I think, much-discussed piece uh, on government innovations and the hype cycle. Uh, and open data was put squarely in the trough of disillusionment. So that's the first challenge, which is, as a sector, uh, we've been around for sort of 10, 15 years. There's been some progress. There's been a lot of promises. Perhaps there hasn't been quite as much delivery on those promises as we once might have thought. The second threat is our broader political environment, where experts are dismissed and authoritarianism is on the rise. In this world, the gains to date of the transparency movement, whether it's the open government partnership, individual examples of open data, or even beneficial ownership transparency feel pretty fragile. And uh, an example of that was that one of the White House's open data portal was pulled down uh, within a month of Trump being inaugurated. So on one level, both of these challenges can feel fairly disempowering, disheartening. Uh, and I know that personally, for me, I thought long and hard about whether there was still space to, o to work on, open on the openness agenda post-Trump, post-Brexit, uh, potentially even post-truth. But I think there's an opportunity here. Um, and I think that we as a community that is geared around evidence, geared around openness, geared around responsive government, can play a role in putting forward an alternative vision. And I think it is now time for the transparency movement, the open data movement, to become more political. Um, and now by that, I don't mean that we should become partisan or that we should support political parties or a particular government's political agenda. But instead, I think we need to uh, position the idea of opening up government information as a political, not technocratic decision. And I think we must position openness as a core value for governments that res who respect and serve citizens. Now, our goal at the Charter, at the Open Data Charter, is to really to try and embed a culture of openness in government and make it resilient to political change. And we've seen this, this resilience to political change, the transparency agenda, being challenged in a number of countries. Uh, places like the Philippines or the United States, which were once governments that really championed openness, are suddenly following a political change, having the progress that's been made to date under threat. So how can we do this? Um, and how can we embed and champion a realistic vision of how open government and open data can be a tool to achieve broader objectives rather than the end goal in itself? So one of the ways that we're going to do this at the Charter 
is by saying to governments that if you adopt the charter, you can send a very public signal that you are on the side of open government, responsive government, government that believes in evidence driving policy making. And we also want to work with individual officials and leaders within government to try and understand what makes transparency sticky within the government process. Like, how can we find those examples of where transparency and transparency norms have survived political transitions and continued to be a core part of how government does its business? We also think that as part of an agenda of trying to make open data, openness, transparency more political, we need to embed these ideas further in some of the key international processes. Things such as the G20, uh, or conversations that happen within the African Union, or the G77 group of southern countries within the UN. So really getting the idea of open government, transparent government, embedded with some within some of these international processes. And we also want to try and foster demand for transparency and demand for government information by working with particular sectors to try and help them use open data and openness as a tool for meeting their own objectives. Uh, and already the Charter Network has done some work uh, on this with the anti-corruption, climate change, and agriculture fields. And we're really interested in exploring how those who are running elections can use open data as part of what they're trying to do. And all of this, again, comes back to this idea of a political agenda of embedding openness in government so that it is resilient to change, so that we can improve service delivery for individual citizens. Now, this is, in many ways, a grand vision. Um, I'm a month into the job. Maybe you think that the challenge we've set ourselves is uh, perhaps overweening and, 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 and unrealistic. Um, what I will say is that none of this is possible by the Open Data Charter itself. Um, the Charter itself is a network of governments and organizations, uh, and we will only be able to achieve some of the things that we want to by working with others in government, in the private sector, and in expert organizations like ODI. So we're really interested, and I'm particularly interested, as we're developing our strategy, and it's been a month, and I can tell you our strategy has already gone through a number of changes, uh, to hear feedback on the, the ideas that I've just explained, the vision that I've just put out for what I think the community as a whole could be doing, and also what we as the Charter will be doing. So to finish, while I see some fairly substantial changes to the work that I think a lot of us in the room do, I think there is also opportunity. Openness should be on the side of informed and empowered citizens. Democracy, innovation, and the fair allocation of resources. It should be against authoritarianism, fake news, corruption, and government secrecy. So in my view, this will need an explicitly political message that openness in government is essential if we want to improve the lives of all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, that was really good, really interesting. I've actually written down so many notes, I can't <laughs> read any of them anymore. Um, what we will do is take some questions from the room, and people who are now on the live stream, uh, if you get on Twitter, we'll try and get those questions out. Um, but I'd like to kick us okay. off. Okay. Um, so I, I had this thought throughout um, the time that you were speaking, which is that in some parts of the open data community, perhaps um, in the ODI itself, we've taken a focus away from transparency or moved away from using the word transparency. And do you, do you think that there are sort of connotations around, any connotations around transparency that are sort of inherently threatening to people who might otherwise engage with the concept of openness or open data? Yeah, it's, it's uh, an interesting question. Um, I suppose part of what I was trying to say is um, that certainly the Charter needs to think about how we can position this movement as explicitly political. And if it's political, it's going to be threatening to some people who don't want to see some of the results that we want to see. Um, I think we should try and be hard-headed and use whatever language is going to resonate with the people we're trying to change their mind. Um, one of the things I think 
we need to be really explicit about is that what we're doing is a tool, it's not an end goal. Um, and people get turned off by transparency, open data. I can tell you having worked on these issues for a while, what they get excited about is can we fight corruption? Uh, can we make elections fairer and uh, reporting them quicker? Can we improve uh, agricultural production, you know, so really trying to think about um, what we're doing is servicing other communities and other people that have impacts that people care about in a, in a, in a real world. Cool, thanks. Um, so does anyone else have any questions from the floor? Someone's got to have one. Jonathan. Just <coughs> Deliberately loaded question. Um, where do you see the media in this? And I ask that because I have a th theory backed up by quite a lot of evidence that the media aren't using, aren't reporting open data and transparency as an issue. They're using it as a source when they do, and they're ignoring it when they don't. Uh, and I th wonder if you've got thoughts on getting them on side. Um, so I think the media, if they've got the right tools and skills and training, um, will be prime users of open data. Um, and I think they can be uh, an intermediary, an infomediary, if you want to use an awful expression, between big data sets that, frankly, most people are not going to look at data sets, are not going to look at CSV files. They can be an intermediary between those data sets and their readers. Um, I think it doesn't really matter if journalists are talking about open data as a thing or as a concept. I think what matters is that they are demanding access to the information that they need to write their stories. Um, and their stories will probably not be about open data in the main. They'll probably be about uh, corruption or misallocation of resources. A, a colleague of mine had a piece in The Guardian this morning around the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland spending a quarter of a million pounds on an election ad that didn't even run in Northern Ireland. Um, and part of the way she was able to find that was through using open data. Um, what people care about is the perception about what a political party is doing, not the open data side. Uh, yes? Sorry, if I can just give me. Uh, you mentioned certain examples of the impacts and benefits of open data. Uh, my question to you is that why are we not seeing a snowballing of such benefits which then drives the open data agenda as opposed to the other way around where we're yeah. trying to talk about the benefits which nobody has ever seen? Yeah. Um, there are lots of people who have written about this who are mo much more experienced and, ca and, and capable of I, but my, my hunch is that one, it's a relatively new thing. Um, two, it's quite technically difficult. Uh, and dare I say, uh, boring. Um, and so getting that engagement, you know, this idea that David Cameron had of an army of armchair auditors hasn't happened. Um, and I think we're now, as a community, getting to a point where we're recognizing that you're not going to have sort of mass people using data, but if you can train journalists and NGOs and activists to use it, you can have a big impact. Um, and then I think there are examples. So um, places like Ukraine is a really good example um, of, of the impact of open data um, improving the delivery of government services. Um, and then a lot of it is, you know, my, my iPhone is packed with apps that make my daily life better, that are all driven by various forms of open data. Um, having said that, I think we need to be a bit wary about examples that focus on getting me to work five minutes l earlier than I could do because I know that the train is going to late, be late because that's not very exciting and there's more that open data could do. So I think part of what we need to do is, is just making sure that the gains aren't reversed, that there is the space for those organizations that are working on implementing open data project from ODI to open contracting to go down in agriculture, have the space, have the space to do that. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd like to, if, if I could add something there as well. Uh, so one of the things is uh, that I found anyway in my work has been that it is very difficult to get to understand where open data is being used, exactly what Robert's point just there about, you know, we can actually see in some of these applications that you can't do this without open data released by TFL, for instance, you won't know about those things. But how do you track that provenance through is the bane of my life. Um, so I think there's that point. And I also think there's a point around 
open data can be really valuable when it when data is shared people can create more value but there's also the case of what data you're making open so if we make open lots of data sets which aren't intrinsically useful then we won't see the massive amounts of value so and on the flip side when you open up things like the lidar data the the environment agency uh, release that it was being paid for you can see some really great examples and you know that that is flowing straight into the companies that it was before and more to produce services off it. So I think and and, and may, I, may I dare even say um, perhaps a, de a degree of humility from those working on transparency that this is a tool in a broader vision about how government should be. So again, when I'm trying to talk about open data as being political, it's one part of a broader package of things that governments need to be doing and using. Um, and almost if open data is working really well, it will be invisible and people won't realize it. Um, and maybe a thought experiment we, we, we could do, and I think that some people have tried to do this, is what happens if you turned off open data for the day and what would the impact be? And think about that in terms of how you can entrench it. Um, and where are the points where people would really notice, transport or weather, and where they wouldn't notice yet because we haven't got far enough down the, the track? Sounds like a fun experiment. We yeah. can talk about this. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, yeah, um, could you explain a bit more about um, uh, openness with the declaration of the ultimate beneficial owner of companies? I mean, this is a problem we have constantly in the property sector. So many uh, residential freeholds are owned uh, by um, you know nom by companies with nominee directors. Ultimate beneficial owner is unknown. Could be offshore. A lot of property in Britain is over uh, is offshore. We've got. 263 billion quid's worth of residential and commercial property registered offshore in this country. So, um, it, it, which is a fundamental issue. I mean, how does a democracy function with that amount of wealth owned by people who are simply anonymous? And in our area of leasehold, trying to reform leasehold law, you know, this hiding behind nominee yeah. directors and anonymity. Plus, using a bit of the defamation law. I mean, leaving aside, you know, whether you can get the data, it's how you can use it and interpret it and write the articles. You know, is, is a huge issue. So I could spend a very long time answering that question. I'll try and do it as short as possible. I spent eight years of my life trying to trying to solve some of that problem. Um, the challenge you face is a really important one. That um, at the moment, it's very easy to own property in the UK through a shell company in the British Virgin Islands. And the British Virgin Islands publishes almost no information about the information. You can't get legal ownership information, let alone who the ultimate owner is. So it's a big problem. And it's a big problem for uh, kind of like citizen engagement and understanding who owns their cities and their countryside. Uh, it's a problem for corruption. There's a lot of corrupt money that ends up in London. Uh, the good news, and there is some good news, um, is that first of all, the UK government has created this beneficial ownership registry for UK registered companies, which is now up and running and online as open data. Uh, the second thing is it has in fact promised to create a new register of the beneficial owners of foreign companies that own UK property. Um, so this is currently grinding through the government policy making mill, um, but the promise is that in a few years time you should be able to find who really owns and controls that company that owns a big mansion or a big industrial complex. Um, that's just the UK. There's a lot more work that needs to be done on opening up confirma company information around the world. Um, and what I would say in terms of the work that we did at Global Witness is opening up as open data is really, really, really important um, because company information is, by its nature, it's quite complicated. Often there's errors and problems. Uh, government, law enforcement do not have the capacity uh, to uncover all those problems themselves. So if you open it up, you allow others to come in and improve, hopefully improve the quality of the data. Thank you. Um, obviously, the US is in quite a bad place at the moment, and it's, it's tough in the UK, but it is a big, wide world out there. So I'm just wondering, do you see particular bright spots or opportunities around the world? You look kind of yeah. globally, because you are a global charter. Um, so the region of the world that has got the most governments that have adopted the charter is Latin America. 
Um, so there's some great work that's being done there in Mexico, in Argentina, but also at the city level, um, the subnational level. Um, then there's some interesting case studies, so places like Ukraine, um, which is in a difficult political situation, but in many ways is a kind of cheerleader for the openness movement. Um, and then there's some initial work that's going on in, in some African countries. I think, and I was just thinking as I was talking about the sort of political narrative, is there's a danger that based in London, we think in a sort of US, European political framework and forget some of the stuff that's going on elsewhere. So that's a, that's a good reminder. Um, one of the things that we're currently thinking about is a uh, sort of s piece of work looking at cities and cities as potential champions of openness. And we're about to get our first American uh, adopter, uh, and it's likely to be a city. So, How do you check the accuracy of data that's being released? So I, I understand that you can look at internal integrity, that people haven't put their nationality as Martian or whatever. But how do you actually check that what has been released is the truth? Uh, the generally, the real answer is you can't, to some extent. Um, what you can do is you can look for red flags. So for example, we found um, 3,000 companies whose beneficial owner was a, another company listed in a tax haven, which looks as though it's non-compliant with the rules. Um, you can also, uh, if you are able to compare it to other data sets, you can start seeing and building up a picture of a company. And so you can start getting and triangulating different sets of information and trying to get a better sense about whether this is right. I mean, I think a lot of the opponents of openness, particularly around company registers, say uh, it will be bad quality data. So if it's open, that's risky. Um, I would actually flip that round. If it's bad quality data and closed, that's even riskier because um, it's less likely that you're going to spot problematic data and problematic information. And even if you do find a piece of information that's wrong, it is at least a starting point for you to try and get more information. So I don't think we should try and think of um, it being fundamentally problematic that all data isn't verified or isn't accurate. Part of the, the sales pitch for open data is you get many eyes on it and improves the quality. Um, now, we can have a long debate about whether that actually happens in practice um, and how many people out there are actually going to do this. But I do th think fundamentally having it open uh, Will, will allow people to interrogate it and hopefully spot problems and mistakes. Uh, do we have any other questions? Apologies, this is probably going to be a bit of a long and rambling one. Uh, I read a blog recently, and, and 10 minutes on Google and Evernote have just failed to find it, which is a shame, um, which sort of suggested that the transparency agenda had in some way been responsible for some current problems because it shifted the balance between public authorities on whom we're imposing a transparency responsibility and vested commercial interests, lobbyists, single issue action groups, et cetera, on whom the same obligation is not put. And I just wondered if you had any comment about that sort of general theme, which I'm not saying I yeah. support. I just thought it was no, an I, interesting I, I, observation. I read, I read the same blog. Um, uh, I think there is an imbalance in terms of information that has to be disclosed. So, for example, for freedom of information in the UK, if you're a government-run prison, you're subject to freedom of information. If you're a privately-run prison down the road, you're not. That's problematic. The answer, in my mind, is not, OK, let's shut down freedom of information, which is what, say, someone like Tony Blair might want to do, but instead, let's try and impose similar obligations on people who are doing similar work. Um, and I also think, fundamentally, like, Government is here to serve us, and it's our money, and they act in the name of the people, you know, in, at, at a very basic level. And so there needs to be a degree of accountability. Um, and so I don't necessarily think that it should be sort of equal transparency between citizen and state um, because of the power the state has and the fact that the state, in theory, is meant to be acting in our, in our interests. I mean, there's also just one final point. There's a, there's a potentially, um, I've heard a sort of version of that which says that greater transparency means that citizens see how bad government is and therefore they don't like government and therefore we have Trump or Brexit. Um, and again, 
I don't like the idea that says, let's keep this hidden and closed and leave it to experts to deal with the problem. Um, let's leave it to you know the PPE graduates who occupy the media and um, the civil service to to work out where the problems are. I think that's that 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 kind of arrogance is partly where maybe maybe we've gone wrong. I feel like we all read that same article yeah. as well. Um, do we have any other questions from the floor or on Twitter? Anna is the voice of Twitter today. No, no. Oh, disappointing. Get on it, Twitter. Oh, we have another one. There we go. So just on the actual charter itself, I mean, yeah. lots of people work on open data. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the charter is this kind of very unique instrument. What's the kind of core pitch of how the charter is going like, to add value and accelerate everybody else's yeah. work on open data? Yeah, so the charter is, is two things now. It's a network of 70 governments and organizations, uh, and it's three people who are the team. Um, so we see the charter's role as being loud advocates for open data and transparency. Advocates in a way that's realistic, um, sees openness as a tool rather than the end goal in itself. Um, and then as part of this overall goal of trying to embed openness in government so it's resilient to political change, we also want to reach out to some specific sectors to try and think about stimulating some demand. So some of the work we've already done with anti-corruption, climate change and agriculture, we're also thinking about doing some work with elections. Um, and then, you know, our approach is very much one around collaboration rather than competition. So, for example, with Open Government Partnership, which have a very similar narrative to us, we want to work with them to get governments that adopt the charter to use OGP as the process for verifying the charter. And signing up to the charter can be one of their commitments under OGP. So we can funnel governments to OGP. Um, with organizations like you know, Open Contracting Yourself or ODI Open Knowledge, we have a government that says to us, we really want to implement an open data program. How do we do it? We can point to our six principles, give some basic advice, and then say, we have this fantastic organization that can really help you with implementation. Um, so the core value proposition for us is really one about a political championing of openness. Voice that will benefit us all, definitely. Um, what, while you're here, if no one else has a question, I've, I've got a question. Oh, no, you've got a question. Excellent. I had to get to throw my question out there. Okay. Uh, very nice job. Thank you. Um, say, for example, individual or companies, if they are thinking of adding specific value to a society, but they need a specific set of data, and who would be taking the initiative, is it the government or is ODI, to lobby to open that set of data? I mean, it really will depend on the data set. Um, the UK government is, has adopted the charter, and under the charter, it has a principle that government data will be open by default. So as part of advocacy that private individuals or companies, or organizations like ODI, they can point to the fact the UK has adopted the charter as part of their argument for why the government should be opening up the data set. Um, it's not something that we're going to be doing. So I think as importantly as knowing what you are doing, you have to know what you're not doing. We're not going to be lobbying for governments to open up specific data sets. Um, there are other organizations that does that. And again, it will depend on the particular field. If it's a corruption-related data set, Transparency International in the UK, um, it, the other data sets will depend on the particular sector. Um, I mean, there is, there, is, there is a challenge we have here in the UK, which is that open data was very much something that Gordon Brown and David Cameron really liked and championed, and Theresa May does not care about it, uh, or certainly not nearly as much as previous governments have. Um, so the UK government is in that process of, like, how do you turn this high-level political thing that was quite fashionable for a while into something that has sustained implementation across government um, when it's not in the current spotlight? Um, and I think that's a challenge for everyone in this, in, in this sector, or anyone working on public policy issues. You know, you have that spark of energy at the beginning. Um, the issue doesn't live up to its hype. <laughs> you have this well, Huffington Post, this trough of disillusionment. And how do you get it to some sort of sustained, ingrained element within government? Yeah, and if I, I can add something to that, from conversations that I've had uh, with people in government, um, a lot of them believe in this, but if you say to them, "Oh, like, why, why haven't you released this data set?" and it says, "Well, no one's asked us for it," like, so just by 
demonstrating demand, if you know about the data sets that you want, if you demonstrate demand, then it gives people within government the onus to push for that release of open data. And I mean, I think we can do this in a, a less adversarial way to start with, because I think that there is something around being de having data demanded and something around this would be really useful data for us. So I, I would suggest just go and tell someone, tell, tell everyone, tell Twitter, and then just see what happens out of it would be my advice. Um, and then you can move to things like freedom of information. Then you can move to more sort of political things. But I think there's a lot of people within government who firmly believe in the open movement and the open data agenda. And, you know, just go and ask them <laughs> would be what I would say. Um, I think... I think we've got about a minute for me to just launch my last question at you, which is, because we've got you in the room. Um, recently, people have been starting to talk about open washing in the same way that they've been talking about green washing. And I feel like you might be, as, as a member of the charter and you know, as, a, as an employee of the charter and a voice for them, might be able to provide us with a bit of context around that and just... Yep. Just tell us your thoughts, really. Yeah. So uh, open washing, for those of you who don't know, is the idea that governments use promises around open data or even the publication of open data to um, launder their reputation, basically. Um, to say, look at all these shiny websites we've got. We've got this fantastic team. They look like hipsters. They're opening up all this government data. And that hides uh, a whole load of other bad behavior. Um, it's definitely, I think, a fair accusation against the sector, and it's potentially a, a, a big hole you could find in the argument that I've spent uh, 20, 30 minutes talking about today. Um, no, 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 no. I think it's it's really good. To, it's really good to point. So the first thing is, I think um, opening up government data, especially if it's driven by user demand, is a good thing, um, even if it's being used by a nasty government to give themselves a PR bump. Um, secondly, those of us in the sector need to be careful about not giving governments wins too quickly. Um, and so that's where things like the Open Data Barometer, the Open Data Index, um, the OGP National Action Plan process, and the review mechanism where there's an independent person who goes and reviews how well OGP governments are doing against their commitments is really important. Um, it's also really difficult. Uh, someone was telling me that 70% um, of OGP commitments have not been met. Um, I still think it's a good thing those commitments were made and that we have a process to know that they weren't met. I think it's a danger we all need to be aware of. And I think it comes back to this idea that when we're selling open data and transparency, we need to do it in a sort of realistic way that um, is aware of some of the dangers and pitfalls. And one of them that I haven't mentioned, and I don't think it's mentioned enough, is we need to acknowledge up front that people will have privacy concerns around open data. And we need to acknowledge that when we're talking about open data, it's not total transparency, and that we're working really hard to think very carefully about how we protect uh, individuals' individuals' privacy. Um, because otherwise, uh, we're, we're vulnerable on that as well. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to wrap up in that case. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for giving us your talk. Thank you.